Hey guys, it's Tuesday, and you know what that means. Another episode of True Crime and Chill, and boy, do we have a big case for you. Okay, so Amber, before we get started in this case, okay, I just, I wanted to tell you that this case I have for you this week was one of the first that I actually put on the list when I started this podcast, below Scott Peterson. It, In fact, it was almost as big as the Scott Peterson case in terms of media presence, rumors, speculation, and mishandling by the police. This case is honestly the perfect example that shows how preconceived notions and jumping the gun can let a potential killer roam free for 24 years. This is the story of Darlie Routier. All right, Amber, this case was intense. Like, that's that's really the only word that I can honestly think of it for it. Um, because yeah, this case is just crazy. It was kind of like the Ketty murders where you just kind of went down all these little rabbit holes. You fell down a lot of them with this case as well. Honestly, this case isn't one that I had a lot of information on, so I didn't even have like the cliff notes. So I'm really excited to hear about it. And so, you know, what? I am super excited about this because this is the first case that we have done that she has absolutely no clue like what's going on. So she's going to be finding out with you listeners. Absolutely. Okay. So, Darlie Lynn was born January 4th, 1970 in Rowlett, Texas. When she was a teenager, her mother, also named Darlie, actually worked at a restaurant in town and introduced uh, Darlie to the assistant manager, Darren. From then on, the couple dated for a few years before eventually being married in August of 1988. In the show, The Last Defense on ABC, Darlie's mom said Darren had commented many times about how beautiful Darlie was and how he had wanted to meet her before she had ended up setting them up. Um, everybody said that when they were married, you couldn't find two happier people, honestly. Darlie's family even said that she was pretty sure she had gotten pregnant on her honeymoon because nine months later, their first son, Devin, was born. Uh, it seems like a pretty good life was being made for them. It really was. Darren ended up um, actually starting his own electronics company with a friend, and that actually ended up doing really, really well. It was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was like computer processors and stuff like that, which, you know, right. for back in the 90s, that was actually a pretty big thing. But it, uh-oh. Huh? I said, oh, your face. You looked like you were about to, you no, looked like I you were like, like yeah, yeah, no p- computer processors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, like it was, it was a big thing. So he obviously made a lot of money off of it. Um, they were actually doing so well that they were able to get a beautiful thir- $130,000 house in Rowlett. Um, and I know like nowadays, 130000 I'm like, that's actually super cheap. But you know, again, it's the 90s. So um, and I mean, it was a, it, yeah. it was a gorgeous house though, but they were able to get um, a Jaguar as well. And he was actually able to take Darlie out to go do a lot of things like, you know, go on cruises, um, go on vacations, stuff like that. that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So they, they really had, they really had the money to support their lifestyle. And this also caused Darlie to actually be a stay at home mom, um, which in turn, she was actually pregnant again and had their second son, another boy named Damon. Mm-hmm. So, according to family and friends, Darlie was a very involved mother with both boys. She was, you know, that house on the block, okay? She had, she was the one where all the gatherings were held at. She had the popsicles and the sprinklers going on the lawn every summer for the kids in the neighborhood. Um, She never really gave the appearance of um, being, like, the kind of homebody mom. She was very much the embodiment of that kind of Southern woman, you know? Hair to the heavens, red lips, pretty pink nail polish and stuff. You know, the little dolly part and smile and everything. Mm -hmm. And she honestly was just a very beautiful woman inside and out. Um, Darren always said that she looked like an angel. And she was very much the woman that you looked at and thought, wow, she really loves her kids. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Darlie's life would get turned upside down shortly after they had their third son, Drake. Um, on June 6, 1996, Darlie and Darren were hanging out downstairs with their son, Devin, who was six, and Damon, who was five at the time. They both wanted to have a sleepover, and Darlie had said that she wanted to stay down there with them. Something I completely understand, because you know, having two young kids, you can keep an eye on them while still letting them have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I mean, you got Sawyer, so... Oh man. Well, and he's like three kids in himself. Uh, but we, you know, we've been, we've lived in the same place since he was born and we don't have like an upstairs and downstairs, but mm-hmm. he has had friends stay over. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you, you have to keep an eye on them or. Yeah, exactly. And you know, with happened. five, with them being five and six at the time, obviously they were more prone to getting into things and like, you know, doing things that they weren't supposed to. Yeah. So sometime, 
Around 11, I believe it was, Darren actually takes Drake upstairs, and Darlie says he kissed her goodnight, and she mm-hmm. settled down with the boys to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Now, the boys were actually sleeping on the ground, and Darlie was sleeping on the couch at this time. Sure, to sleep So, I'm, yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it might not be too big of a thing, but you know, that's always something that you need to have in your head there, like, where they were positioned. So, a few hours later, a 911 call was made in Routlet at 2.31 p.m., at 2.31 a.m., okay? On it, you hear a woman in hysterics. Mm-hmm. And when I mean hysterics, like it's kind of hard to understand what she's saying at some point. I don't blame her. We're gonna play a little. We're gonna play a little clip of it so you guys can hear what I mean. So just from that 911 clip, like I even just paid like a tiny, that is six minutes, yeah. six minutes I of just, a 911 call. It, 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 it's it's so entire to hear. Like, even if you can't understand what she's saying, you hear the tone, like the frantic and it's, I, mm-hmm. I'm having a hard time like separating myself from that. Like I'm, I'm getting very emotional, just putting my, I, I, I easily put myself in the shoes um, of, yeah. of people in those situations, like when I can hear the desperation and and just I, I can't even I yeah no and that was that was a, that was a six minute call. Now at the end of it, and like we're gonna have we're gonna have that entire nine one one audio as well as the transcript on our website truecrimeandtroll.com. so you can listen to the audio or read the transcript or have them together as you're listening to it and stuff. But um. At the towards the end of the call, you actually hear the first officer on scene talking to Darlie and stuff and telling the 911 operator, hey, we're here, this is what's going on. Now, one thing that really kind of bugged me about it on top um about it was the the 911 operator's voice. Okay. You know, I get that you have to kind of be like, hey, we need this information, what's going on? But you know, she's sitting there screaming, My babies are dying, my babies are dying, and she's sitting there going, ma'am, what's going on? okay, well, are you dispatching people? Are you doing this? Are you doing, she seemed a little snarky on the 911 call towards her. And that's what I was, that's, I was kind of like listening to it. Like what? I I suppose. Um, so I don't know if you know this, my dad did 911 calls for a while. Yeah. And, uh, I know that actually it's an interesting story. One time he took a phone call that ended up being my mom calling because the field next door to our house was on fire. Um, oh my god yeah that was uh it was one of those where he's like wait debbie and she's like wait bob <laughs> so wait bob um but uh i mean you have to you have to remain calm and you know and yeah mean, sometimes it's really hard to not bring your personal life into work right so if you've just had a series of rough calls where you're just like oh my god what yeah. the heck? you know like can you just tell me what's wrong like just calm down and tell me what's wrong but also she doesn't know who to dispatch either 
right? Yeah, true. Um, and so until she knows who to dispatch, obviously, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously glad that she dispatched the police to at least check out what was going on. Oh, God, yeah. No, right? she, yeah, and at the beginning of the call, you'll hear her dispatching them saying, hey, this is what's going on. And so the police actually eventually got there while Darley was on the phone with the 911 operator. Right. And now, so, I mean, it sounds like it was at least a wellness checkup. Like, hey, this lady's in hysterics. Can you go there? Uh, and then he gets there and he can go, oh my God. Yeah, because they definitely were not, like, even the first officer on scene was like, I was not, ex- like, he was like, we heard, like, we knew, like, this lady was hysterical. We knew that something may have happened to her kids, but we were thinking, you know, maybe one of them fell down the stairs or something happened. He's like, I was not expecting to walk well, in and see. No. And again, the crime scene photos are just absolutely insane. But on the 911 call, we hear Darley begging, and for those of you who don't want to listen to it, which is understandable, it is very hard to listen to. Um, we do hear Darley begging 911 operator to hurry up and get an ambulance to her house due to the fact that she and her two boys had been stabbed. Right. You see, Darley had woke up that night because Damon was shaking her awake, telling her he hurt. Darley said that the way his voice sounded shook her out of the fog that she was in just in time for her to see a man walking through the living room, back through the kitchen, and out the back door. Now, all of these rooms are connected, so it was just one straight shot. The back door led into a garage, actually, that was kind of like a, well, not really a garage, but it was like a back porch type, screened in type thing. Sure. And yeah, so, um, that's, that, yeah, yeah. so that's what it led through. So she had ended up jumping up and ran after him, not realizing what was going on around her, more than likely because she was in shock. Durley had said that she had fought with this man that had come into her house and she did have the marks to prove it. Mm-hmm. He had been carrying a kitchen knife when he fled and dropped it and Darley picked it up and put it on the counter. That's when she was able to, that's when she turned around and realized what had happened to her and her kids. So what, what confuses me though, is that she was stabbed and it didn't wake her up. I mean, I know I'm a deep sleeper. Like I can sleep through thunderstorms in a cabin at the lake, but like if my boyfriend rolls over in the middle of the night and smacks me in the face on accident, it wakes me up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I've, I've gotten kicked in the face by my kid plenty of times for it to, and out of a dead sleep too. Right. But honestly, and you know, and prosecution brought that up. How did you sleep through this? How did you do this? And honestly, um, if it was just a simple home invasion and they were, whoever did it was caught by surprise, they obviously they would go after the adult in the room. So with the wounds and we'll be getting in, I'll, I'll explain these later, but with the wounds that she had, um, defense actually argued that more than likely it was due to shock and she had gone into like a a state to where she probably was awake but she wasn't realizing it right so because of how much blood she lost and stuff so at this point she had run over to check on both of the kids before um running to the stairs and screaming for darren who of course jumped up and ran downstairs and saw the scene right he was actually quoted in the tv show the last well tv series the last defense which is about darley's case um and honestly it's a very it's a very non-biased look at the case actually because a lot of the stuff that is out there has actually been very biased against her right um and that's, but he's unfortunately of- that's really common in the media like they'll tend to sort of sway it the way that the public sees it because then more oh, likely yeah. they'll- it'll, sell, it'll sell better it sells better right but um so he was quoted saying i see darley at the bottom of the sh- stairs and she's just screaming Devin 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 over and over again and like he said like the look on her face was just like just this like look he never saw on her face before and she's just screaming her kid's name and everything and um when he got downstairs Darley was already on the phone 911 trying to get them to come as quick as they could right so now what exactly was the scene like like were the boys still alive was it a quick thing like their throats were slit see and that's this is where the weird part starts, honestly. So okay, as I said before, all yeah, I know, right? Like it's not weird enough already, but in investigators' eyes, this is where it started kind of not making sense. So as I said before, the three of them were downstairs having a little sleepover. So it would be one thing, like I said before, if someone had broke in expecting them to be upstairs, got startled and quickly slit their throats, but that's not how any of this went down. Autopsy reports would later show that both boys had been stabbed about four to five times each between them. 
Darren said that when he ran downstairs to check on the kids while Darley was on the phone with dispatch, he tried to give Devin CPR, but when he breathed into him to give him CPR, all the air just escaped out of his lungs because of the holes in his chest. Yeah. Damon was a few feet away and moaning, but like his brother, he eventually did succumb to his injuries on the way to the hospital. However, he was alive when paramedics got there. The paramedics were able to actually intubate him and start doing compressions and start trying to stop the bleeding, but both boys, their lungs were punctured. So these stab wounds weren't just superficial. Not at all. Both boys were honestly stabbed through and through. Reading the autopsy reports, um, which are actually found on um, the Darley websites that we will link in the in the on the website, um, you find out that Devin had four stab wounds: one in the upper left chest, one in the mid left, one in the left mid portion of his chest, one on his forearm, and then one on his left uh, posterior left thigh. He also had some abrasions on his left hands and all the stab wounds, but but the thigh were through and through. So the thigh was basically like, I think, uh, they think maybe it was just kind of like that was that may have been the first one. Because the prosecution tried to say maybe that was the first one. And Darley was kind of like hesitant on killing him. And then once she stabbed him that one time, she just, she realized she needed to go through with it. Which is why it wasn't a through and through. Now, Damon's autopsy said that he had a stab wound on his left mid-back, a stab wound on the right upper back, right mid-back, and lower right mid-back. Devin ended up actually um, bleeding out in the, uh, like I said before, Devin ended up actually bleeding out in the house before the paramedics got there. So he was dead on arrival. Um, But Damon was still alive when the paramedics were there. And the paramedics saw him kind of like moving his head, like moaning, um, crying. Um, Darley actually said that her last word, like her last words to him were, baby, hold on, they're coming. And he goes, uh, like, baby, hold on, they're coming. Uh, Just be strong. And he goes, I'll try, mommy. And that was the last thing that she ever heard from him. Oh. Yeah. So it, it it's it, yeah. So it's 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 rough. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I just so it sounds sounds to me with the position of the wounds, it seems like the kids were still asleep on their stomachs or curled in a ball, which is really common for kids. I mean, that's how I sleep. Yeah. And you, I mean, it. I can't believe I'm going to say this because this is this is dark. This whole thing so far is just dark. But it's almost like oh, you yeah. know, like just a up. You know, like dune, dune, like up the way. So that would explain yeah. like a thigh and then a side and then a back. Like to me, logically, like if no matter who it is, no matter whether mm-hmm. it was her or somebody who went in the house, totally unbiased. Yeah. What I'm saying is it sounds like it's just like a one, two, three, four, like right up the way and then done. Which, yeah. Who would do that to a kid? I just, I'm. See, it actually makes me kind of sick to my stomach to think that somebody would do that to a, to a kid, let alone two kids. Right? Right? I, no. Okay. Anyway. Um, but y- you would think that if they were all getting stabbed, Darley would wake up. You would think. Unless, like I said before, whoever did it wanted to take out the only adult that they saw in the room. Yeah. Okay. So you see, when Darley was on the phone with 911, she was telling him that both she and the boys had been attacked. But you could clearly hear her speaking. Doctors would actually attribute what she was doing to shock. Like the fact that she wasn't realizing like how bad her injuries were. I know that um, some of the, when the police got there, they weren't expecting her to be that, to be as bad as she was, including the paramedics. So when when paramedics got there, Tarly was messed up. And I mean, it is a miracle that she is still standing right now. Like it it was, it was almost three bodies in the house instead of two. Right. But it's like you hear those stories about, you know, mothers lifting cars off their kids. Like it's that pure adrenaline that, you know, it's it's a mother's instinct. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So on top of all the cuts and bruises that she had on her body, which obviously showed that she had defended herself against someone. Darley had a stab wound in her right arm that was all the way to the bone. And when I say stab wound, I mean stab wound because that's exactly what it was. It was like somebody had tried to come down and stab her with the knife that they had. Um, she had another stab wound on her chest, um, wh- which was about probably, it's not the right side. I, I, it's not the same side that I'm showing it on, but it was about right here. So if people who aren't watching, it's probably about two inches below her collarbone that she had this stab wound. Okay. Um, she had knife marks on her hand. So like where, um, where her joints on the inside of her, on the inside of her hands meet Mm -hmm. and stuff. She had knife marks on there. Like she had grabbed the blade of a knife and it got sliced through her hand. Mm. Um, 
And she had a giant bruise that actually wouldn't show for another day or so from her left wrist all the way up to her elbow. The biggest wound that she had, though, was actually on her neck, which was sliced. If it had gone two millimeters to the left, she would have bled out right then and there. In fact, when they got to the hospital, they had to rush her to surgery because she because they because they thought that she already had an artery hit because when they touched it, it squirted blood out of them. Oh um, the necklace that she was wearing was the only thing that had stopped it stopped the knife from going any deeper. It was actually embedded into the skin so badly that the paramedic on scene had tried to remove it, but left it in because every time he did, it tried it, it hurt her. So he just he just left it for the doctor and the doctor actually had to eventually surgically remove it at the hospital. Oh, that's insane. But looking at the pictures of the injuries, it is a miracle that she didn't die that night as well. Exactly. And those injuries to her alone are gruesome. And again, we will have those pictures on the website so you guys can judge for yourself. And that's not True including her son's com. injuries. Huh? Yeah, truecrimeandchill.com. Yeah, so we will have those on our website and stuff so that we kind of look and kind of judge for yourself. But those, but like, we obviously we don't include the children's pictures at all. The only pictures we have in there are just cute, like little family pictures and stuff. But you'll see her injuries. Um, so Darlie actually ends up making it through the surgery. And she is finally in her room with her nurses. And every nurse report has said about the same, that Darlie is very upset in and out of anesthesia. She has a picture of Damon and Devin and, and she just, you know, touches it and she just cries and cries and cries. The reports also read like the nurses reports also read that they did have to sedate her for a little bit because of it. Um, and they had to make sure that her family didn't talk about the case so as to not agitate her. I mean, I don't blame them. Like she just went through this incredibly traumatic experience and had life saving surgery. So it's not a surprise that the nurses would want to keep her calm. I just, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, no, they were all super worried about her and for a good reason. Whoever had done this was still out there. Mm. So two days after her surgery, Darlie had actually left um, the hospital to return home to her to her husband and her young son. Mm -hmm. um, but her nightmare was just beginning. Sadly, you see, from the beginning, police had their eye on some had their eyes on someone that. Someone in the house did this. It wasn't somebody from outside. It wasn't some random person. They they truly believe that somebody inside the house had done this. Mm. And where have we seen this before? Hmm. A couple times, actually. Exactly. And at first, they were actually looking at Darren. Because, you know, Darren was upstairs with Drake, mm -hmm. sleeping, and apparently had slept through all of this. Um, when well, Darlie was in the apparently. hospital... Right. Well, yeah. But when Darlie was in the hospital, the police came in, started bombarding her with questions. And granted, and like she was on anesthesia at this time. She was on anesthesia. She didn't have a lawyer. They just kind of came in and started bombarding her with questions right after she got out of surgery um, about what kind of father he was and would and would he have any reason to do this? And so Darlie's sitting there thinking, oh, my God, they're trying to blame him. Right. Well, I mean, he's asleep upstairs the entire time. And you're telling me he didn't hear any part of the attack until Darlie started screaming. Honestly, and that's what I thought because I was like, that, "That's kind of weird." But when I look at the house, um, so we, so when I looked at what the house was like and stuff, and there's pictures of the house, and it is this giant house. It's probably about the size of yours. Oh, okay, yeah, it's pretty big. So if the boys were stabbed by someone else, the fact that the that it punctured their lungs made it really so they couldn't scream for help. So it's not really surprising that if they were making a noise it was just too quiet for darren to actually hear or you know like when noises happen and you're you're in a deep sleep and it kind of becomes part of your dream yeah yeah so that so that might have also been a thing but darlie was adamant that darren wouldn't do this that it was somebody that had broken into their home and attacked them but the police refused to believe that i mean what exactly did they refuse to believe wasn't there evidence of someone else being in the house there was but you know police had tunnel vision on this case and Darlie had, I think it was up to four interviews with them by herself, completely just telling them what was going on and everything. So she, she never really acted like she had anything to hide, but it's not surprising when that they do have tunnel vision when it's the murder of two young boys and they don't really have a suspect. No. They had started looking at Darlie because of a few, they started looking next at Darlie because of a few things. Right. One in her 911 call, she was heard saying that, you know, her babies are dead. Her babies are dying. Her babies are dead. However, police wondered how she could actually know that for sure without, you know, knowing. Well, I mean, it was an ungodly amount of blood based just looking at the crime scene photos. So I don't blame her for assuming that. Also, I know I would be assuming the worst and not in a headspace. I mean, that that shock alone puts you in a totally different headspace and you can hear it in her voice in the call. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And, you know, and there there really was a lot of blood. Like, I looked at the amount in just the living room alone, and if I were her, I probably would have thought the same thing. On top of the fact that um, she was also injured in dealing with blood loss and shock, and adrenaline alone was keeping her up. So, another reason that the police were looking at her, because also in the 911 call, and you guys will hear this, the operator tells her, don't touch anything. And Darley goes, I've already touched the knife. I may have messed up evidence or fingerprints on it. Darley later said in an interview that that thought never actually crossed her mind until the operator brought it up, saying, don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. And that's when she was worried, oh, no, I may have ruined evidence. Well, right, because, I mean, if it were me, I would want to make sure that if a person broke, okay, if a person broke into my home and stabbed my children and myself, the first thing I would want is for that person to be caught. A lot, you know, I mean, okay, the first first thing I would want is my kids to be okay. But then the other yeah. thought that would run through my head is I need this person to be caught. And so she's automatically going, oh my God, I might have messed up evidence. Then she realizes that that could be the link to the person, right? So, I, I mean, I get why they would be a little suspicious of her saying evidence, yeah. but it doesn't mean that she killed her kids. And trust me, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But unfortunately, there are a few more things that they were looking at. Like the fact that the knife that was used in the attack was from their house. Police said, why would somebody break in to kill these people but not have their own weapon to do it? Mm -hmm. Also, the back screen for the window on the back porch was cut on the outside. But the dust on the windowsill inside of the porch was still undisturbed. And the soil below the window didn't have any footprints on it. On top of that fact, Darley was right next to her kids and she didn't, and again, they reiterated, she didn't hear them being stabbed or wake up because of it. I mean, like we said before, he could have gone straight for Darley knowing she was the only adult that he could see, as well as the break-in might have only been started as a break-in. Like, he wasn't expecting to see people and improvised. Yeah, exactly. And... That's that's honestly what a lot of people think. Like a lot of people when Darley got arrested were were honestly behind her. Like they still think that she that she didn't do this. Mm-hmm. But it that wouldn't explain but you know it wouldn't explain the screen being cut from the outside unless the perpetrator had a knife of their own. Right. Again, which would be used if they were just planning on robbing the house. Um but obviously it was one that he didn't use in the attacks because the blood because the blood of both Darley and the boys had been all over the kitchen knife. I mean, Unless he also used his knife and took it with him. Yeah. But that would had, also explain he could have had a pocket the, knife or something. Yeah. Right? Or like yeah. a, a switchblade or like a hunting knife or something that he But I mean it would him. also explain why the first why the first uh stab wound on one of the kids wasn't through and through. Mm-hmm. Right. Then he may have realized, he realized it, it sounds it's awful. He may have tried using his own knife, realized it wasn't sharp enough for what he was trying to and do. And went and got a different one. Yeah. So at this she, point, I guess, Hoffa- but usually stabbing is a, is a he. Usually. Yeah. Not always, so at this usually. point, cops are already looking at Darley, but still making it known to the public that they're looking for somebody else. Mm-hmm. So they didn't want Darley to know that they were looking at her on June 14th. The day that was supposed to be Devin's seventh birthday, the Routiers and their family actually held a gravesite party. What do you mean party? Okay, so when I when I mean party, I mean there was party and like there was a sense of balloons, flowers. They sang happy birthday to Devin. They had like a little cake for him. Mm-hmm. Um, just basically, you know, celebrating the birthday that he was so looking forward to. Yeah. Because he was. Darley was stated in an interview from the grave from the uh, graveyard that day, like he wanted so badly to be seven years old. And so we want to be able to celebrate him for doing that because he was looking forward to his birthday. He was looking forward to turning seven. He was looking forward to having a party. He was looking forward to celebrating it with his friends and stuff, you know, getting toys and everything and stuff. And so, you know, she wanted to be able to celebrate him and his brother the only way that they thought they, they knew how. But the only thing that was shown to the public was the fact that Darley, Darren, and their family were spraying silly string on the boys' graves, and they were smiling while singing happy birthday. But they didn't show the fact that, you know, Darley was in hysterics over her babies before and after they did this. Like, she was able to put on that brave face um, after having a solemn memorial just before they sang happy birthday for that. Well, and I mean, just because she acted like that doesn't mean she killed her kids. Uh, Everyone grieves differently. And an example is, you know, when I was young, there were some kids who were um, killed just a couple blocks Mm -hmm. away from where I live. And their grave for, I mean, years, literally years up until 
probably just a couple of years ago. And this happened in like 90, I want to say 96. So right around mm-hmm. the same time as this, sadly. Um, uh, their, their graves were covered with, with toys and gifts. And they were, you know, the parents were, well, not the parents, cause it was the dad did it. It's a long story and we can go into another day, but, um, the mom was always there and she was putting toys and leaving gifts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that this really doesn't make unsense to me, which is, yeah. weird, but it, it makes sense to me because I've, I've seen it with my own eyes and, you know, yeah. my own experience. So, I get that everybody grieves differently and, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me that they did stuff that maybe they had already been planning for the birthday. Exactly. And, you know, I, you know, and me being up here in Colorado, I know a mother who lost her son to a murder yeah. and stuff. And I, I like every day she is posting about mm-hmm. how happy he was and what a beautiful soul he was and how we need to live like he did and like she's like posting challenges like post a funny face with your family members and stuff and everything and it's it's I I enjoy it because it's showing that you know she's sharing like she like you know when he went missing and he was found like we all kind of came together as a community and we were all just kind of like it, it affected all of us it affected all of us in some form or another and Can you see how, how strong she is it's a little ridiculous <laughs> but like how strong she's been during this and I've seen so many people say like well it doesn't look like she's like grieving over her son. And it's like, you know what? You don't see what happens behind closed doors. Right. Okay. And, and women who, and honestly, in my opinion, women who lose a child and are able to power on like she's been doing. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you don't miss your child. It just right. means that you're able to, because you know, both of them had, both of them had kids. Yep. Darley still had Drake and you know, and this woman still has her two other children. So, you know, you kind of have to, have that brave face. Yeah. Unfortunately for Darlie, um, her, the way she was acting at the gravesite was enough for the police to actually bring her in on another interview. Again, she willingly went in and about halfway through, they actually told her that they had a warrant for her arrest and they arrested her right then and there. Mm-hmm. So on June 18th, Darlie Routier is arrested on capital murder charges of her son. I understand that speculation was there, but did they have any actual evidence that Darlie did this? Nope. They really did not. Actually, almost all of it was circumstantial. Shortly after Darlie and the boys were taken away, the police started taking a look around, taking pictures, collecting evidence, and they end up actually finding a sock from the house about 75 yards away from from the house. After testing the blood that was found on it, forensics determined that the blood did, in fact, belong to Devin and Damon. So that backs up her story that someone was in the house that night and did that to them and ran away. It does, except again, tunnel vision. The prosecution tried to say that Darlie stabbed her boys, ran 75 yards to drop the sock off, okay, come back, gave herself those wounds, and then called 911. I mean, but the severity of her wounds, first of all, uh, it's actually really hard to do that to yourself. Like, it, it's your body has natural resistances to allow you to do those kinds of injuries to yourself that deep. Yeah. I can actually snap my finger off with my teeth. Like it's a carrot, but my body won't let me. Right. So even, I mean, but even if she did do that to herself, it would take longer than that. Like she probably would have had to just stopped at the stab wound to the chest and arm. Like she, Mm -hmm. she would not physically be able to do some of those other injuries to herself. Exactly. So, that was, I mean, that that's that's a huge thing for her case because they're trying to say that she did all of this. And like I, like I tell you, the 911 call was six minutes long, okay? The a police officer arrived, I think, two minutes before the 911 call actually ends, okay? Yeah. So technically, that's four minutes on, that, on the 911 call, okay, right. that came in at 2.31, okay? So she would have had to have... Um, There was no actual time of death for the kids on the autopsies that I could see, but she would have had to have stabbed both boys and did all of the, and then, and then cut herself to make the mass amounts of blood from herself as well. And then run and drop the sock off and then come back to the house and call 911. There's no way she would have been able to get through all of that without passing out from the pain. Uh, Right. Uh, Yeah. So 
But the doctors also said that her neck wound was superficial only because it didn't nick the artery. So they were able to repair it fairly quickly and it wasn't a life-threatening thing because they were, they were able to repair it. However, if her necklace wasn't there to stop the knife, it would have been a lot worse and it would have nicked her artery. Unfortunately, all police heard were Darley's injuries are superficial. So Darley has put out to the public that she has not killed her boys. From day one, she has remained adamant that she has that she didn't have anything to do with them, that somebody was in their house that night. She is being set up. However, the police don't see it like that, considering two years before, in Texas, another mother, Susan Smith, had said that she had been carjacked with her two kids inside. A few days after she had been making tearful pleas and cries on television to have her children return, Susan ended up confessing that she had actually wanted to run off with a man that she was in love with, but she didn't want her kids to slow her down, so she drugged them and drove her car into the lake, drowning them. Well, I mean, a couple things here. First of all, she drugged her children because she didn't want them to feel pain. I don't believe they found any drugs in these kids' bodies. Mm -mm. Um, Second of all... I mean, I can understand the hesitation because of that case, but every case is different. Just because this other woman decided to do terrible, terrible things to her children does not mean that Darlie is the same. And, you know, I I know that. We know that. Other people know that. But the police also found out that Darren and Darlie were having a little bit of not money troubles, but Darren definitely wasn't bringing in as much as he was. Um... Well, with just three kids, with three kids and a wife, you know, a five person, you know, a five person thing. Mm -hmm. They weren't, you know, they weren't going destitute, but they definitely weren't bringing in, but they weren't definitely able to not have as much of a lavish lifestyle as they did because, you know, they had three kids, but everybody always said the same thing. Darlie didn't care. However, police and prosecutors used that against her. Well, she obviously wanted to be able to live that lavish lifestyle again. So she staged this whole thing. But then that brings up the question of, why didn't she kill her youngest son either? Right. Was it because he was upstairs with his dad? Like, why didn't she just insist on having him stay down there with them so she could so she could do it to him as well? well especially because babies are the more expensive. You know how much I spend a month in diapers alone? Mm. I don't want to re- like, I remember. That it was. Yeah, no. So, unfortunately as well, the police and the media put a different story out to the public, and that's what the public saw about Darley. Right. Prosecution was still dead set on the fact that Darley had staged everything before calling the police, mainly because the fibers from the screen that was cut were actually found on the knife, but it actually came out later that the same like brush thing that they used for to dust for fingerprints yeah. was used on the screen and on the knife. Mm-hmm. And I don't and you know, window screens, they can easily get the fibers, put it on the knife. So cross-contamination was completely possible. The fact that there's no other evidence of somebody being in the house, plus the video from the cemetery, really cemented in the public's eye that Darley did this. And after only seven hours of deliberation, the jury came back with a guilty verdict and ended up sentencing Darley to death row. So first question, did they sequester this jury? You know, honestly, I don't think they did because, you know, it was the 90s. There really wasn't any, like, internet tabloids or anything like that a lot from from a lot of the transcripts i read from when they picked the jury from when they picked the jury it was hey um yeah you know i heard about it but i haven't really like you know looked into it sure and stuff like that they did have it they did actually have a change of um venue so they actually did move the case and stuff like that out of Rowlett. Sure, so that a way lot, people a lot who like were in Rowlett were Anderson. Yeah. Trying so, to you know, find jurors who didn't know. Texas is freaking huge. Yeah. Okay. Something that happens on the east side of Texas may not go all the way to the west side of Texas. Sure. And especially again, it's the nineties. There weren't cell phones. There weren't like internet. There weren't like there wasn't Google and everything. It's not like with the Scott Peterson case where there was tabloids everywhere yeah. and internet and and right. all this stuff, and it was thrusted in your face. But 96 is also when the O.J. Simpson case happened. There was a that lot too. of news and media on that one. And the that jury was, Darley's case was actually the jury rivaled was on that one. Yeah, Darley's case was actually rivaled. But I think because a lot of people who don't live in Texas have actually never heard about this case. Because, I mean, it was it was a huge thing in Texas because it was not only were it, was it this woman who's being accused of her son's murders, but... It was also two years after the whole Susan Smith stuff ha- went down. So everybody's like, what is going on with these moms in Texas? Is it something and- in the water? <laughs> I mean. Are they drinking from the Rio? 
Right. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that was that was my first. I just I had a question about that because that was yeah. kind of. I feel like that was a big thing with the Scott Peterson case. Uh, actually, yeah. it was. They just didn't sequester them, and they they right. went based off what they got. Well, and I was talking to my mom. You know, so again, my parents are both crime true crime people. My mom is all into, you know, murder mysteries and she watches a lot of like murder. She wrote and British shows that are murder mysteries. And then my dad was like unsolved mysteries and he watches cops. So I was talking to them about the podcast and I told her that the first case we covered was the Lacey Peterson, Scott Peterson. And she's like, Oh yeah, no, he totally did it. I was like, really? Well, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know they didn't sequester the jury? And she was like, what? And I was like, right. (laughs) So, you know, I have to ask, if they sequester the jury. And it sounds like that, you know, that piece isn't out there, whether they did or not, because if they didn't sequester yeah, the jury. Yeah, and I, I couldn't find anything. And, you know, and I listened to a few podcasts on it too, and I couldn't find anything of them saying that they sequestered them. Sure. So I'm not quite sure. I do know that there was a change in venue and stuff. Right. and Which makes sense. With Texas being huge, they, they were probably able to get a jury um, no problem for people, you know, who've heard about the case, but really didn't dig too much into it and stuff. So, sure. but, um, but that might be it, something if, I don't know if the, I mean, if the appeal people ever listen to our podcast, which is highly unlikely, but if they do, that might be something they look into for the first, um, you know, for the first case, did they sequester the jury? Because if they didn't, and the media was so against her, yeah, that might be why they came back within seven hours. But yeah, I don't understand how they're able to do that. She had defensive wounds on her from fighting someone off. Her hands had cuts where she grabbed the knife. And wasn't there a partial fingerprint? Yes. Okay. Okay. So th- this fingerprint is like the focal point of her appeal right now. So this case is a really good example of what happens when police and media get tunnel vision and twist evidence to support their own truth. Mm-hmm. And the evidence that didn't support the fact that, Gar- that Darley was guilty was actually just kind of cast aside, like the sock they found and the bloody partial fingerprint that didn't have a match to anyone else in the house. Mm. You see, the fingerprint, or 85J as they like to call it, right. um, was only a partial fingerprint. Now, back then, it didn't match anybody in the house that night. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was found, and it was found honestly going towards the back porch, corroborating, uh, Darlie's statements about that night, as well as there was hair follicles and stuff that didn't match anybody else in the house. The the hair follicles would be hard though, because it sounds like she entertained a lot of people. No, and, and and that is true, but the hair follicles were found on the way, the route that the guy would have taken. So, but, but still, you know, it's still a thing to where it's like, okay, if you find these, maybe you should like, you know try to do this. So this is what they're trying to do. The issue is, is back in 96, fingerprinting and DNA testing wasn't the best. Yeah. So they never really tested it correctly in tr- to try and find the person that it belonged to. Right. So it seems like there was a ball dropped here. Honestly, I feel like this case probably could have been handled a lot better. But, and that's what Darley's family thinks too. But I can also see how their first assumption and their main assumption is going to be that it was somebody in the house. Like, that makes the most sense to start with. Like you start in the yeah. middle and then work your way out. And if they can point pinpoint it in the middle before having to go out and start this crazy manhunt, especially because in a neighborhood, if children are injured, they have so much more pressure to find the person that did it, especially from the people in the town because they want it solved and they want it solved now because everybody is scared. Yeah, and that's and I mean that's understandable and stuff, but unfortunately what happens is is you get tunnel vision. Yep. And they didn't really look outside the house. Right. They just kept looking at Darley. Right. So in 1998, Darley actually ended up uh starting Darley and her defense actually ended up starting an appeal for the case. Mm-hmm. It was then that they actually found out that a lot of court transcripts had errors in them, like a mm-hmm. lot of errors. But the court reporter actually refused to comment on why. So they ended up getting the actual court transcripts and like getting them corrected and stuff. But this was still like this huge, like what is going on? So they also found out that a lot of evidence that the prosecution used in the courtroom to damn Darley, like the doctor statement saying that she wasn't upset. Like the doctors that they actually had doctors saying, you know, she really wasn't upset. She wasn't panicky. She wasn't crying. Like she didn't really, um uh did they show not a lot of emotion. 911 call? Um the fact that her wounds were superficial, and I put that in quotations for people who aren't watching our video. The fact that her wounds are superficial were all twisted 
from the doctor's notes, again, to fit the der- narration on who Darley was. All the doctor's notes contradicted what the doctors, uh, what the prosecution was, were, were saying that the doctors had said. Those are all of it. huge inconsistencies. I mean, all they had to do was play the 911 call to, to contradict that she wasn't hysterical. And they did. They played the 911 call, but they only played the clip of her going, I touched it. I messed up evidence. They they played it in clips. They never the the jury never actually listened to the full nine one one call in in its entirety. Okay, but why they, didn't the prosec- why didn't the prosecution the pick? Again, it was ninety six. They probably didn't think that they were gonna. They probably didn't think that they had anything. And you know when so when it's like this, okay. So when it's when you go into a case like this, okay, the defense has absolutely no idea what the prosecution is going to use right. until they go to trial. Right. So I understand the that. prosecution had all this time to get all this evidence against Darley and then show the jury in court the these these specific clips from the 911 call they wanted them to hear, like her saying, I messed up evidence, her saying my babies are dead, my babies are dying. The the clip of her celebrating at the gravesite, but not the clip of her crying on her mom's shoulders about it. Sure. So, but what I'm saying is why didn't, why didn't the defense then go, okay, so you've submitted this as evidence. Can we see the whole thing? Please, can we hear the whole thing? Because it was already submitted as evidence, right? So they're allowed mm-hmm. to use the whole thing. And the defense I'm not, could have said. Honestly, I'm not sure. There is an entire website. Like there, there are like three websites dedicated to helping Darlie clear her name. Mm-hmm. And all of them have such amazing info on it. Like, this is where I got most of my info from it. And I will have the links for them on our website as well. But if we learned anything from the Scott Peterson appeal, just because it's clear and present that this evidence does not add up, it does not mean things will be fixed. Right. Another huge issue is the fact that a federal, federal, let me repeat, federal Mm -hmm. Court judge granted permission for Darley's defense team to actually run DNA tests on the fingerprint and the hair follicles found at the house. But the state of Texas, let me repeat that, the state of Texas refuses to let them do it. (laughs) So right now they are tied up. That is why, that is another reason why Darley's um, execution date has not been scheduled. Because, Because the appeal is open and they are tied up in this legal battle. With the state of Texas to get this information and to and to get this DNA tested, she they can't give her an execution date right now. Mm. So you would think that if they were right, then they would just let them test it and get it over with. You would think. One would think. However, if the match comes back to someone else, then that proves that the state of Texas actually convicted the wrong person and has had a killer walking free for twenty four years. So that really wouldn't let that really wouldn't look too good on them. But isn't uh, so, and isn't there a way though that because it's a federal judge that says this needs to be done, like they can override the state of Texas? You know, and I was wondering that too because it is a federal judge, but you know, Texas is Texas and they have their own set of rules and their own set of laws. And um, I'm pretty sure that something in there is stopping them from doing it because it was the state of Texas that condemned her, basically. Yeah. But and what- they're also trying to use other evidence too, like heads up for our listeners. And everything. Did you know to become a forensic? Uh, I can't. I can't remember the name of it. But somebody who um, do, who like looks at and identifies blood spatter and like stuff Dexter. like that. Try, huh? Like yeah. Dexter. So like that. You know, it only takes about sixty four hours of your time and a little over six hundred bucks to become certified in that. Yeah, they used somebody who did that. Who, who did the exact same thing. And who said that Darlie's shirt that she was wearing, the blood spatter was consistent to the fact that she stabbed her boys. However, and again, I will have the picture on the website. Literally, you couldn't tell where it ended and where it began. Well, and she was checking her babies. I mean, yeah. She and they even had somebody else who was actually up, like, right? so yeah. And they actually had somebody else who was in, who went to school for this, come back and say, no, this person's wrong. Like, that's not how this goes and stuff. So, Yeah, so there, so you know, there's a bloody t shirt. There's the fact that she would, but it, they really tunnel, tunnel vision this stuff. It's like they really tunnel vision. Just like, and it's interesting how many things from other cases that we've already covered in the few episodes that we have, right? Like, Mm -hmm. for example, there's a fingerprint, right? There were fingerprints at the Ketty cabin, and yet nothing's been done with them. And it's the same kind of, you know, like thing. There's a, there's a partial fingerprint. 
and it's nobody that's in the house and it's on the kitchen. Now it'd be one thing if there was like, oh yeah, there's fingerprints on the doorway. Well, they were hosting kids all the time. So it makes sense that there'd be fingerprints on the doorway going in and and out, right? Because kids Mm -hmm. are in and out, in and out, in and out. You know this. But a fingerprint on the knife, like there's no way another kid's going to use the knife. And nobody other than, you know, Darlie and her husband should have been using the knives. So, Mm -hmm. um... If I remember correctly, they actually did not find fingerprints on the knife that did not belong to Darlie. So it did have, you know, Darren's fingerprints and Darlie's fingerprints and stuff, but they did not find fingerprints on the knife. However, if, say, you know, like, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that could have been explained for that. Now, if you go to the website, darliesLastDefense.com, okay, there is a bunch of reading and material that you can look at and stuff. Now, there's an article that was posted in 2002 in the Texas Monthly by Skip Holt. I'm going to I'm gonna butcher this last name, so I apologize, Skip. Um, by Skip Hollinsworth, I think I said that right, called Maybe Darley Didn't Do It. And he was actually um, the first journalist to really examine Darley's conviction with a critical eye. Uh, he wrote this article for Texas Monthly, and it's still actually one of the best ways to dive into the case. Um, the website says Skip is an excellent writer, and then we are happy that he agreed to lend his perspective to the last defense. <laughs> there is actually another um, uh, book called Blo- the, well, I, yeah, it's uh, well, it's a article, I guess would be it. It's called Blood Will Tell Part One and Blood Will Tell Part Two by Pamela Koloff. Um, it was published in ProPublica and the New York Times Magazine in May of 2018. Um, and th- this is where the blood spatter analysis comes in. It's blood spatter analysis has played a significant role in Darley's trial. And everything that I'm reading is coming from Darley's last defense. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you guys can read all this on here as well. Um, with the prosecution claiming that the patterns in the blood throughout the first floor of the Routier's house proved that the crime scene had been staged. But the science of blood pattern analysis has been under scrutiny for more than for, in more recent years. Right. In this two-part series, writer Pamela Koloff explains other dubious convictions, so more than up, so not just Darley's case, based on blood spatter testimony. Hmm. Uh, part two features the writer going through the training course sold by Tom Bevel. Bevel, that's right, training course, not school. The blood pattern expert, expert. I'm putting that in quotes for people who don't watch our video who testified for the prosecution on Darley's trial. For $655 and 40 hours of your time, you too can testify as a blood spatter expert. (laughs) For those of you that can't see my face right now, I'm pretty sure if you know me, you know what face I have. (laughs) Yeah. So it, it, it's absolutely, and it's just, it's absolutely insane. There's actually another, um, um, another woman I cannot, um, and when I, when I've, when I dive a little bit deeper and stuff and get her name again, she wrote a book basically saying, uh, basically talking about how Darlie killed her kids and how the defense proved this and all this other stuff. Well, eventually, I don't know if she had sat down with Darlie and talked with her or if she actually, you know, looked at the case with a critical eye like she was supposed to before writing the book. Mm-hmm. But now she is officially on Darlie's side saying, no, this woman could not have killed her children. Awesome. And so all the proceeds that she makes from the sales of this book go to the family to pay for the defense lawyer. Nice. Nice. So, I mean, it sounds, like, come on. So it sounds really to me, I mean, from the information I have from this, which obviously isn't everything that's out there, right? It's just what you yeah. me. Uh, it sounds like um, both between uh, the, the police trying to solve it quickly in order to appease, you know, the, the pressure they were probably receiving from the locals. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the people that were working the case and the evidence that was presented in the case. So it sounds like the prosecution had, you know, was just a stronger force than her defense. That's overall yeah. what it sounds like to me. But what I don't understand is, you know, okay, because it's all speculation at this point, right? Darley didn't do it and Darren didn't do it. Uh, what motivation would another person have? And see, and that's the thing is like people have, I'm pretty sure people have asked Darlie and you, you know, I honestly don't know. And it, it, it could have honestly been a home robbery gone wrong. Like, you know, when somebody breaks into a house, they're not expecting to find people sleeping in the living room. But sure, then at the same time, if- why didn't you just turn around and go away? 
But so, there has never been any kind of mention of Darren having an affair. There's never been any kind of mention of Darlie having an affair. Like in a lot of these cases that I look at, there's always, you know, one of the spouses is always having an affair of some sort. Right. Neither of them did. They were both so head over heels in love. And even though that they're divorced now, mm-hmm. um, Darren is still completely on Darlie's side. He is still head over heels in love with this woman sure. and stuff. And so, like, so let me, I want to take a minute here. I've been reading uh, in cold blood right? Mm -hmm. My dad recommended to me. And in that, it's interesting because it was very much like a robbery more or less gone wrong, right? Yeah. The family was was killed because people were trying to rob the house because they were told that this guy was rich, right? He just didn't keep any money in the house because he was smart, right? So it's almost, I mean, if they had a big house and a jag in the driveway, right? Yeah. To me, it makes sense that somebody who's looking for money yeah, I'm going to try and break in there. But I don't understand why they wouldn't, you know, wait until the family was gone. I don't, you know, I mean, they could have even done it home alone style. Like guy comes in, poses as a cop, been like, oh, are you going anywhere anytime soon? You know, Uh, you could, you know, and I suppose, yeah, if he came in in the middle of the night expecting nobody to be downstairs and then all of a sudden, you know, oh my God, they're downstairs. Why not just leave and come back another time? Although then again, if there was evidence of a break in, then it's going to be like, oh, shoot, they're going to ramp up their security. So I can't come back another time. Yeah. I... <sighs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, it, and you know, and that's one of the things that the prosecution had. Who would have a reason to do this? And even Darlene and Darren themselves, they said, we don't know anybody who would do this. We don't we don't know anybody who would. So. Sure. But it, I mean, like I said, they have a big house and a jag in the driveway. Yeah. So to they me, were, that they, I mean, they could have been a target just because of the money. Target. Yeah. And not- so now it's 2020. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now, now it's 2020. Okay. It's been 24 years. Darlie's defense is still saying that she's innocent and the real killer is out there. So she's still on death row. Darlie's execution day has not been um, decided due to the case being reopened. She is actually doing what she can to help from behind bars obviously and you know she's she's giving interviews she's doing stories on like what's going on like i said um darren and uh darren and drake her youngest son like drake the only way drake's ever seen his mom is behind bars like he can't even he hasn't touched he is 20 years old now i believe 24 like he he's yeah so he was eight months when the boys were killed it's been 24 years so it's he, he he's never been able to touch his mother and the only time that he's ever been able to be held by her, he can't even remember because he was a baby and stuff. And so, like, he visits her. He visits her often. Um, and, I mean, they're still on her side. Every Her entire family, Darren's entire family, is still on her side, which is which is good. And that's um, a lot. She actually, sometimes that can cause a huge separation. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said before, her and Darren are actually divorced right now, but it wasn't because he didn't believe her and he made sure to put that out there when it came out to light. Like, no, it's not because I don't believe her. It's just, you know, we've been in limbo for so long that we don't know who we are. We don't know what's going to happen now. We don't know what's going to happen. And she didn't want him to have to wait to see what would happen. See, it says a lot about her too yeah sorry it does. oh yeah so she actually ended up on on the website darley's last defense she actually ended up sharing this absolutely beautiful letter to everybody who's been helping out with them and like the last part of it is basically thank you for reaching out for holding me up and standing with me in this fight to obtain real justice for my precious devin and damon and exoneration for myself from this horrible injustice and wrongful conviction God and each of you are my pillars of support. All the way you reach out, stand by, understand, and continue to uplift me and day uplift me daily and help me endure which there is no understanding or sense. Your actions have demonstrated your courage and confidence, showing that each of you has something to contribute and your voice can and does make a difference. Thank you for being truthful, loyal, and considerate, for touching my life with your amazing soul. May God continue to bless you and yours greatly. Now I'm hoping, and as are the, as is the defense, that um, eventually the state of Texas will stop at the roadblock and let them have this appeal and let them test the DNA. I mean, but even if they do, and it turns out that Darlie was in fact innocent this entire time, it doesn't erase the fact that Darlie had to mourn the loss of two of her babies in behind bars under scrutiny from the public and miss out on the lo- life of her last son Drake. Like I said, Drake is a full grown adult now. Like he he. He's his own person. He's a full-grown adult. He is, he's, 
and she's she's missed that. She's missed prom. She's missed graduation. She's missed dances. She's missed first girlfriends. And you know that that's not something that you can really get back. And that's something that she's very adamant about. Like in every interview, and everybody's like, "Well, what 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 will happen? What do you have to say if it turns out you are innocent?" And she yeah. goes, "There's really nothing that I can say, right? Because I am innocent." Yeah. And due to this, I've now lost out on not just two of my baby's lives, but my third too. So if Darley didn't kill her boys, then who killed Damon and Devin that night in June in 1996? Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.